Thank you, Mary. I appreciate the introduction. Hello, everyone. As Mary mentioned, I'm Kevin Sharp, Head of Business Development Sales at Samsung Biologics. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our first ever virtual networking forum, Shaping the Future of Pharma. Earlier on social media, I noticed many of today's panelists are wearing blue. I wasn't sure if it was because of today's blue butterfly theme or the chance of winning a Samsung Galaxy Fold 2 later today. I don't know, maybe it's both. But in case you're wondering, today's blue butterfly theme encompasses three core concepts. First, blue, representing Samsung. Second, better, recognizing continuous improvement, striving for better, for a better life. And lastly, fly, illustrating the butterfly effect, where the small things we do every day accumulate and make a broader impact. As the future of pharma is being shaped before our eyes, we as an industry experienced a major disruption from the COVID-19 pandemic that has impacted not only our business activities, but our personal lives and the conveniences of daily living. For me professionally, I miss traveling to meet and interact with clients on a regular basis. Forums such as today's would have taken some, somewhere nice, taken place somewhere nice such as San Diego or maybe in the Northeast Biotech Hub of Boston. Personally, I miss the opportunity to travel back home to the US where I could visit family. However, now I we now rely on technology previously limited to business applications and conduct Zoom parties. While the patients uh, we serve suffer from this virus, our industry is uniquely positioned to provide treatments and cure for humanity's sake. The pharmaceutical industry has come together in both areas of R&D and manufacturing to collaborate with a common goal. Such collaborations include Beer Biotechnology and GSK, AstraZeneca and Oxford University, along with Eli Lilly and Amgen. Samsung Biologics has also had the opportunity to join the fight against COVID-19 through both existing client relationships and forging new partnerships. With this week's news of Pfizer and its biotech partner, BioNTech, releasing phase three data on its ex experimental pandemic vaccine candidate, which shows more than 90% effectiveness, it demonstrates how collaboration can promote innovation and provide hope to a promising future in pharma. As an end-to-end -end CDMO service provider, Samsung Biologics has witnessed eye-opening development of biologics over the past decade. And these innovative drugs have led to improving and saving countless lives. With increasing advances in science technology and innovation, complex therapeutics are set to become even more important in improving healthcare worldwide. Samsung Biologics has positioned ourselves to be a major contributor to support pharmaceutical companies in the development and manufacturing of such treatments, including COVID-19. According to Bio, such innovations are transforming patient outcomes. For example, 83% of children with cancer now survive, compared to this 58% in 1970. There has also been a 22% reduction in cancer deaths since 1991. And more than 730,000 children's lives have been saved in the last 20 years in the US alone due to advances and vaccines. We are honored to be a part of this journey to shape the future of pharma, supporting our global partners in drug development and manufacturing to keep pace with the ever-growing trends in biodevelopment and manufacturing. Samsung Biologics is committed to delivering high quality services to help produce life-saving medicines and make them more accessible to patients globally. Our recently announced Plant 4 expansion is in response to the growing demand of biologics, which we believe will benefit not only our clients, but ultimately patients in need all over the world. The scale of capacity offered in Plant 4 will be unmatched, resulting in a standalone end-to-end -end facility offering services from cell line development to small, mid, and large-scale manufacturing to meet all clinical and commercial needs. I believe we are gathered here with a consensus on the need to address the prolonged global pandemic and healthcare challenges we are all being faced with. 
Today's COVID-19 Emergence Roundtable will provide a forum for industry leaders to openly discuss not only these challenges, but also the opportunity, opportunities that have been created for us to make a direct impact in the fight against COVID-19. Many would argue that the COVID-19 pandemic is the greatest healthcare challenge we've faced since the AIDS pandemic or the pre-penicillin era. Globally, there have been 52.4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, including 1.29, I'm sorry, 1.2 million deaths, as reported to the World Health Organization. The pandemic is also having an enormous impact on business sectors across all industries, while also receiving public sector support via programs such as Operation Warp Speed, and working closely with pharma companies to ensure expedited approvals and access to treatments and vaccines. Pharma companies have partnered in the fight against COVID-19, breaking down barriers by collaborating and sharing know-how without a profit-first mindset. As some may say, there will be a new definition of BC before corona and AC after corona. Even when the short-term effects end, the long-term economic impacts will ripple for years to come, putting us into a new normal environment where collaboration and innovation will have the opportunity to come together within our industry, such as today's virtual roundtable where pharmaceutical leaders have gathered to have such a conversation. Is anyone familiar with the notion of VUCA? VUCA is an acronym which stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, ambiguous. The term was first used at the end of the Cold War when there was no longer a singular enemy, resulting in new ways of seeing and reacting. The concept is, again, gaining popularity within industry leadership strategies as a term to cover the various dimensions of our uncontrollable environment and uncertain situations. Today we are fighting a new war against the enemy of COVID-19. The VUCA world was here before COVID-19, but the pandemic has made change faster and harder to predict. In defining a VUCA in a COVID-19 mindset, it would look something like this. Volatility. Changes due to COVID-19 are taking place every day. They have been unpredictable, dramatic, and fast. Uncertainty. No one can predict with confidence when the pandemic will end or when we will have a cure or vaccine. Complexity. The pandemic is affecting all aspects of life, including healthcare, business, the economy, and social life in very complex ways. Ambiguity. There is no best practice that organizations can follow to manage the challenges caused by the pandemic. Luckily enough, with the many pharma and biotechs joining forces with resilience, perseverance, and innovation, we are hearing positive news about promising drug candidates, providing hope for a vaccination in the near future. Such collaboration is enabling the development and supply of treatments with unprecedented speed, where we as an industry and as humans have come together to further enrich mankind. Bill George, senior fellow at Harvard Business School, has defined a new type of leadership. He calls it VUCA 2.0 giving a completely new meaning to the acronym. V, vision. As today's business leaders, you need the ability to see through the chaos to have a clear vision for your organization. U, understanding. An in-depth understanding of your organization's capabilities and strategies to take advantage of rapidly changing circumstances by playing to its strengths while minimizing its weaknesses. C, for courage. Leaders need the courage to step up to these challenges and make audacious decisions that embody risk and often go against the grain. A, adaptability. Embracing the need to be flexible and adapting to this rapidly changing environment is required more now than ever before. As humanity makes choices and we continue to progress, the VUCA world may spell out something to make individuals, families, organizations, and humanity survive. However, the question we must now ask is, how do we thrive instead of just survive? 
We hope this networking forum will offer you a chance to raise and discuss such questions, as well as share key considerations on business continuity, resilience, and adaptability during and after the pandemic. This forum is designed not only to share with you the experience and insights of our knowledgeable, highly selected panelists, but also to provide a platform for you to share with us your invaluable expertise, opinions, suggestions, and expectations about the future of pharma. Samsung Biologics is a young company that has made significant strides towards the goal of making a positive impact and enriching human lives by creating a biologic ecosystem for our global partners, some of which I mentioned earlier. We don't aim to make such breakthroughs alone. Instead, we ask you, the industry leaders, to join us on the path to achieving this common value and goal, the unmatched objective of better life for mankind. On this notion, Samsung Biologics would like to express our sincere gratitude to all participating professionals gathered here today who are dedicated and willing to realize a common vision to enrich human lives in the industry that we serve. Thank you. Hello again, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual roundtable, COVID-19 Emergence, brought to you by Informa Pharma Intelligence and sponsored by Samsung Biologics. I would now like to introduce our moderator, Ben Comer, Executive Editor at Invivo. Ben brings both biopharma expertise and diverse experience. For the past five and a half years, he was a senior manager in PwC's Health Research Institute. He developed reports on various policy issues and business trends, particularly in the pharma and medtech sectors, provided research for clients and spoke at industry events. Previously, he was a journalist with Pharmaceutical Executive, Medical Marketing and Media, PR Week and Direct Marketing News. And with that, I will hand things over. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mari, and thanks to everyone out there who's watching. Uh, we have a, a really fantastic panel for this discussion, uh, which I'd like to quickly introduce um, just, uh, just before we get started. We've got Peter Martz, who's director of CBER at the FDA. We've got Ken Getz, deputy director of the Tufts Center for the Drug Study, for, excuse me, the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development. We have Karen Young, the U.S. Health Industries Leader at PwC. We have Dr. Michelle McMurray-Heath, President and CEO at Bio. We have Phil Pang, uh, Chief Medical Officer at Veer. And last but not least, Anna Cespedes, who is Chief Operating Officer at IVIA, excuse me, IAVI, apologies. Um, let's, let's go ahead and get started. We're talking uh, in this session about lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and, and looking toward a brighter future, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge here at the top that COVID-19 case counts and hospitalization rates have, have reached an all-time high in the U.S. Uh, with now over 241,000 deaths to date. So the work and learnings will continue, uh, but let's start at the onset of the pandemic. And my first question for, for the panel is, what were the biggest challenges for your organization following the COVID-19 lockdown, and how did you overcome these challenges? And, and Phil, I'd, I'd like to start with you on that. Thank you so much, Ben. Well, you know, I think that the challenges were really divided between those who had to be, so uh, the, the, rather, that could be socially distanced and those that could not. So I think that, as you know, we are working on a prophylactic and therapeutic for COVID. And of course, if the people can't get to the lab and can't work, that becomes a huge major challenge. Uh, and at the very beginning, we had challenges even securing basic uh, uh, personal protective equipment. For those that could be socially distanced, i.e. those lab, uh, the non-lab workers, it was a much more straightforward process. We were able to overcome that using, you know, uh, technologies such as Zoom and video conferencing. And I would say it got us, you know, 80, 85% of the way there. 
Uh, but in terms of getting our lab uh, workers into the lab and working, you know, it really took a lot of creativity, a lot of shift work, a lot of uh, recognition that, you know, it could take, for example, you know, 20 minutes to gown up for a BSL-3 experiment, and that person would be stuck in there for four hours and might not be able to use the bathroom even, for example. So I think creating a lot of fluid processes that allowed people to really get in and out and get their work done uh, was something that, you know, really just took a lot of uh, creativity and, and, and time. Great, and I want to bring you into this question uh, as well, Anna, uh, maybe speaking about your, your organization on, on the biggest challenges uh, initially with the lockdown and, and how you overcame those. Did I go first? Yeah, Anna, that, that one's for you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I, I can go. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear my name. So, um, yeah, we, we set up for ourselves what we call like a triple mission. So first, we needed to protect the patients. That was a challenge, patients that were in our trials. Second, to protect our employees. And then to, to also shift our research to bring value into COVID, like leverage our infectious diseases expertise into, into this space. So in terms of protecting patients, we have stopped, obviously, as everybody else, we post recruitment for the trials. We implemented remote tools and we also you know put a lot of attention into into data integrity to do risk losing this data in terms of employees we had a similar experience to the one from phil there were a group of people who needed to be in the lab all the time and just securing the approvals to get these people in the lab was an effort in itself then we most i mean a significant part of the people were working from home and in those cases something we, we've been seeing at the beginning, and we see this increasingly, was implementing activities and tools to enable these people to feel comfortable working from home, from learning to manage a team remotely, to mental health. Because some people were having with the tough situations, being alone at home, living in an apartment with no family for months. And then finally, you know, moving our research towards COVID. That was probably the most exciting part of everything, moving our antibody and vaccine platform, leaving a little bit on the side, HIV, TB for a little bit, and trying to see how we could unlock pathways in antibodies and vaccines for, for COVID. Great, and I, I want to follow up this question on, on and you, I think you uh, mentioned an important piece of this that has nothing to do with technology, which is simply, you know, learning how to work at home and, and do all sorts of things remotely. But, but what kinds of technology were, were most useful for maintaining business operations? And Peter, I, I want to go to you with this one, maybe for the FDA perspective on this question. Yeah, so um, I, we've we we actually just just to back up, we 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 have had some of the uh, same problems as everyone else because we actually have laboratories that do applied scientific research. Those were the most challenging to deal with here, um, still. Um, uh, and uh, the 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 move to uh, telework has been very much welcomed. Um, I think the 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 technology. We're using a fair amount of WebEx, a fair amount of Zoom, and we've even now started with Teams. Everyone has their own favorite platform. Um, uh, I, I think actually uh, the, the largest problems we've actually seen is actually trying to manage people uh, just overbooking things from dawn till dusk on, uh, on these platforms. Um, because what we've noticed is that people can get so booked for meetings now that they didn't, they didn't, then they don't have time to keep up with the email. And email traffic is probably about five times, I don't know about your, your organizations, but since the pandemic, it's gone up by about five times over it was pre-pandemic because that's how everyone's working. So if you, if you don't have time to get your email, then we, we've had people overworking. So we're using pretty standard tools, you know, <laughs> usual email and various, uh, uh, and various platforms, be it Zoom, WebEx, or uh, or Microsoft Teams, um, and 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 they're 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 doing the job. Nothing, nothing. Great, exciting. and, and Karen, nothing really exciting, but there's <laughs> nothing. We don't. We we we're kind of vanilla. We're making use of the vanilla options. <laughs> yeah, Ken, Ken, did you want to jump in? 
I just wanted to add, I mean, I think a lot of the points that are made are exactly what we've experienced as well. One of the one of the areas that I just wanted to point out is that organizations that were already operating with a partial remote uh, workforce and they'd already experimented with certain tools, they perhaps had piloted some of these, uh, the adaptation, some of the pivoting, it was a lot easier for them early on. And they, in some cases, Peter, they even had a standard in place, whereas other organizations had to quickly pivot and find uh, that standard platform. Yep. Can I yeah, just, great, I just and, and Karen, I, I would, yeah, I go just ahead. Something to say that that, that, that that is exactly correct, that for us, because we've been telework ready, and we've had to deal with various issues, it made a huge difference. I mean, that that it, people were generally ready to go when it came, and it, that, that was made, made a big difference. Karen, I wanted to see if you had anything to add on this point. You know, PwC is a, a large firm with a network that stretches all over the world. You know, what, what kinds of technology were, were most important for you in, in transitioning into pandemic mode? So Ben, thanks. And I think, you know, we really, you know, started preparing for, you know, upskilling our workforce um, several years ago. And so when we had to shift and shut down offices, regions, locations, and pivot a lot of our work that we do on site, you know, side by side with clients and go into a virtual mode, those tools such as Altrix and Tableau and, um, you know, various virtual abilities to communicate with each other, um, you know, WebExes, Zoom calls. Um, we pivoted pretty well. I would say very proud of what we were able to do. And it was all making sure the safety and productivity of our employees um, was always top of mind to make sure that they, they were comfortable in the environment they were in. And then you think about business continuity, which is something we talk about a lot. Um, and many companies prepare for the uh, business continuity, but I'm not sure everyone prepared to go virtual so quickly. And um, just to comment, I think Ken made the comment about the grind of 24-7. And I think we try and make sure we keep that top of mind with our employees and teams, as well as our clients, as we engage throughout the day uh, and getting projects done and, and interactions. Great. And I'm wondering how folks on this call would, would rate the biopharma industry's response to the pandemic uh, and, and maybe what you might do differently in hindsight. Uh, and, and Ken, I'll start with you on that one. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> uh, from where we sit, I would give the research enterprise high marks for the way it has pivoted in relatively short period of time. And if you look at how quickly we have been able to adjust but remain productive and innovative, we're looking at over 400 treatments and vaccines in development. Uh, we'll talk more about what's happened to ongoing clinical trials of non-COVID treatments. I think most organizations are finding eight months in that their companies, their organizations have remained relatively productive. In fact, in some cases, they're ex experiencing much higher growth than they anticipated when we first went through extensive lockdowns. So short term, I would give us all high marks. In our opinion, it's the long term uh, place where we have yet to see the kinds of behaviors that would garner similar marks. And let me be specific, a lot of what we're doing is piloting various initiatives, putting support behind them. But uh, like uh, so many other innovations that we pilot, if we don't build the foundation to move the pilot into more common practice, uh, we're going to run the risk of seeing these pivots be essentially one-time occurrences. Not many organizations have developed a decentralized clinical trial governance plan and a way to scale that and maintain that. They haven't developed continuity plans to move other programs into this model. And so it's that kind of thing. Workflow has not been modified fully to really anticipate long-term uh, changes in the way we operate. And so it, I'm waiting to see what will happen long-term before I can give you, Ben, a, uh, a grade, a rating uh, th that's basically our view. 
Michelle, how, how would you rate the industry's response to the pandemic so far? Yes, well, first of all, thanks for having me. And I must say at Bio, we get a very interesting view because the Biotechnology Innovation Organization represents over a thousand biotech companies. Um, and so we've seen many of them small companies. We've seen how they've pivoted on a dime to be able to really try to assist in the response to COVID. So I would give them an A or A plus <laughs> because I really think it's been remarkable to see what they've accomplished. You know, we're up to over 800 development programs now actually globally for antivirals, therapeutics, and vaccines. 191 vaccines are in development, I'm sure Peter, Peter's team um, has many a late night because of all of that activity, but it really speaks to international collaborations, collaborations between big companies and small companies, collaborations with industry and governments. It's just been remarkable to see the flexibility of our different industry members to really try to be a part of the answer. And, and Lat, Peter, before we move on, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on the performance of, of the biopharma industry thus far. Yeah, I actually agree with all the groups. Like, this is like a, a uniform uh, a group of graders. I actually, I agree that this has been very high marks for industry and in being able to pivot, being able to adjust, being able to work and collaborate, uh, communicate, maintain continuity of trials where um, it would have been easy to walk from some of these, but they've gone through all of the extra effort to keep, uh, you know, patients who contributed to trials in trials and, and using remote assessments when possible. So very high marks. I, I wish I could say the same about some of the uh, challenges with getting academic clinical trials moving um, uh, the same way, uh, but I think industry has done an incredibly mm -hmm. good job. And, and can I just jump in there as well and just give a salute to Dr. Marx because part of the amazing response that you've seen in industry is the incredible support that we've seen from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And I say that as a former uh, FDA official. They have been incredible in their flexibility, their creativity, and their incredible commitment to making sure that we have safe and effective products to fight COVID. Yeah, and Michelle, I'll, I'll stay with you for this next nice question. Um, uh, which, which regulatory or legislative actions have been most important or, or useful uh, to, you know, to, to bio or to, I guess, the biopharma industry at large uh, during COVID, in your opinion? Well, you have the man that coined Operation Warp Speed, Peter Marks, on, on our panel today. But it's really been this incredible concerted cross-governmental effort to say we're going to help with the research and development portion. We're going to help with the regulatory portion. We're going to help with assured um, purchasing programs so that companies know that if they're successful, there'll be a market. And then we're gonna help through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to have a distribution plan that makes sense and that works out the logistical kinks that sometimes stands between patients in the last mile of therapy. So it has been the coordination that has been most remarkable and most influential. Great, and I, I'm curious too about the the rate of communication. And Anna, I, I want to ask this question to you: Has your communication with regulators increased uh, during the pandemic, and why or why not? Yeah, I think I want to echo what is being said. FDA has been extremely responsive, not only in terms of you know providing the right support that you needed, but also very fast that you could submit pre and the information and, you know, very, very soon you could get an answer. And this has been pivotal for success and to be able to, to move. So I really think that it's been tremendous, the support that everybody has been providing to advance. Um, within all the bad things that were happening around us, this was really, you know, making feel very good. This, this level of support of regulators and, and collaborators in, in other labs and in the pharmaceutical industry. Great, and I, I also want to ask, you know, there's a, this issue of vaccine hesitancy that people are talking about. I, you know, I've, I've seen signs on the doors of Walgreens and CVS Pharmacy saying we do not yet have a COVID-19 <laughs> vaccine yet. So I, I think there are two sides of, of the story. 
here, but I, I wanted to ask, you know, what, what should government agencies like the FDA, HHS, and CDC do to promote public confidence in a COVID-19 vaccination and therapeutics uh, following an authorization or an approval? And Phil, I, I want to go to you on that question. Thank you so much, Ben. So maybe I'll, I'll take a, a three-prong approach to, the, to answering that. First is, obviously, confidence is built through trust, and trust is built locally. And I think that we really need to be reaching into the communities and having all the physicians uh, be able to have some, some place where they can go to be educated themselves. Because if the local physicians don't feel confident, then of course there's no way we can expect the general population um, you know, to, to feel confident. And so I think that that's one major uh, avenue. But I would say that as we do so, I think one of the things that I, at least I'm seeing anecdotally, and, and you, you came up with a good example of, you know, going to Walgreens and people realizing there's not a vaccine. You know, we have challenges because, of course, a monoclonal can be used for both prevention and treatment. And people are confused whether or not a vaccine is, is taken before or after you get COVID. So if that is the, the challenge before us as a nation and as a world community, um, we have a long way to go and we need to be really getting out in front of it. And I think the biggest challenge will be differentiating between clarity and oversimplification. I think some of that challenge we had with, for example, the mass confusion, and I think we need to avoid that confusion so that people are realizing, yes, vaccines are awesome, prevention is the way to go, that is how we are going to end this pandemic, but at the same time, we can't uh, neglect the fact that treatments will also be necessary. And as we go out there and have this campaign, it shouldn't be you get your vaccine, don't, you don't have to worry about COVID anymore. I think you know, complications like the need to achieve herd immunity and therefore the need for treatment until that is achieved is, is something that is complex, but we need to get out there in front of it and not just have people asking the question, when is a vaccine available, but everything in the ecosystem that's going to be necessary to achieve uh, control of this pandemic. P Peter, what do, you, what do you think that government agencies should do to promote confidence in, in vaccines or, or, or therapeutics after an authorization? Yeah, so I, I think for us, I, it's a little different for therapeutics than vaccines, right? Because I think there's not, we don't see therapeutic hesitancy the same way we see vaccine hesitancy. And, and, that, and that's fundamentally why what we have to do with vaccines is different than therapeutics. I think that our EUA mechanism for uh, therapeutics, I don't think that's a problem. People aren't worried about the, 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 uh, the efficacy standard there, which is that the product may be effective because if you're really sick with something, you're pretty happy to see anything that's gonna help you. On the other hand, for, for prophylactic vaccines for healthy people, you, you know, even when it gives you a sore arm, you're kind of grumbly about it, even though you know it might protect you uh, against something pretty bad. I think we need, for, for, for the vaccine end of things, I think we have to have as transparent a process as we possibly can about what we're doing at FDA to make sure that they're safe and effective. We're going to be absolutely transparent, have public advisory committee meetings, post our documents. And then ultimately, I think we will have to work with CDC and get communities engaged because it's going to be people's, they're gonna, I mean, when you look at the list, it's like, well, if my, my primary healthcare provider tells me that it's good and they're gonna take it, maybe I'll take it. And then after that is, well, if my pastor tells me or my clergyman tells me that they're gonna take it, I'll take it. Um, and then if it's my friends are taking it, I'll take it. So we're gonna need to get people engaged in this. And I, I do think this is a place where kind of a campaign of we're all in it together um, uh, will be necessary. But it's going to be on that foundation that at FDA, we've done the job to make sure that people can see that there's no you know, funny business, that this is the real deal that we've put out there. Excellent. And I, I want to move on to looking into the future a bit. And Karen, I'll, I'll start with you. What, what new opportunities, strategies, uh, or silver linings have come out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, and I think it's been mentioned a few times, right? The collaboration across the different um, aspects of the health economy and ecosystems, whether it's governments, academic medical centers, pharma, or biotechs. Um, but in addition, also the transparency aspect that has really been paramount during this uh, pandemic. I believe the industry itself has, has been much more transparent because they've had to be. And I think the, the um, patients and consumers 
are, are really going to look for that transparency to continue. Um, back to the comment around trust around vaccine. One thing that we see that that will hopefully um, start to happen post this pandemic, we're calling it the CEO flight simulator concept. And that how do you forecast for the future? This won't be the last pandemic. This won't be the last natural disaster or, or disruption to our health economy. And so how do CEOs get behind forecasting scenario planning for the what if scenarios? They've been through so much in the past eight months. Um, they've got a lot of data and insights into what worked, what didn't work, and how quickly they needed to pivot. Um, and so how do you look for those early warning signs? How do you look for those opportunities to be more agile in the future around supply chain, R&D, and production? Great. And Anna, I wanted to... Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to add to Karen's comments, and I, I agree with them completely. Just a few other areas to toss out. One is the remarkably high awareness and visibility, public awareness and public visibility around uh, the, the importance of clinical research. And um, that's been a silver lining for the pandemic. It's had an interesting and uh, harmful effect on the public's willingness to participate in clinical research. So while awareness has risen, willingness to participate has actually declined. But I think we can really build on this foundation and to the points that Phil and Peter made with a really concerted and coordinated education effort. I think we can really address that. So it's really created that renewed awareness. And then the other point, something I had made earlier, just the volume of activity that many organizations are dealing with unexpected uh, increases in activity. There's been a real silver lining for many companies. They're busier now than they've ever been before. And uh, Peter, to your point, the email boxes are just growing and growing. So uh, I think everybody feels like uh, cutting out their commuting time has added more hours in the day uh, for us to actually be doing more productive things. And it looks like we may have lost Peter, but I, I did, Anna, I wanted to follow up with you on the, you know, Karen's point about partnership and collaboration. And, it, you know, if, if you think you're likely to be outsourcing more or less, or if there's anything you would add about changes to the collaboration model. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I really echo what Karen said. I think the collaboration between pharma and organizations like us, so we are a public private partnership has been fantastic, like starting to work without having all the legal paperwork completely figured out. And we were just already working together because we needed to make it happen. To me, that has been a model that has enabled like fast progress and needs to continue. I also would like to highlight then the importance of organizations like SEPI. So SEPI was created in 2017 to really tackle these topics. And we've seen SEBI in action. And I think Richard Hatchett has done a tremendous job in really advancing kind of R&D programs towards these areas. I probably think we need something similar to SEBI for the therapeutics space. And I think this is something that we might need to, to, to advance in the future. Initiatives such as COVAX um, with, the, with the leadership of Gabi to really make sure those vaccines will also reach uh, in no middle income countries. I think this collaboration between public and private entities to really ensure both development, but also supply later on has been something that, you know, we put in practice certain mechanisms and we have realized certain gaps that we'll have to fix in the future. Right. And, um, how, Ken, I wanted to get back to, you know, you mentioned this uh, previously, but uh, I'm curious about how COVID-19 has impacted um, product development in therapeutic areas beyond COVID-19 vaccines and, and therapeutics. I mean, do, are you expecting, you know, to see a, a, a kind of some products being pushed back later or getting approved later uh, due to the the you know, necessary focus on COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics or, or, or no? It's a great question. We're actually trying to forecast that now at the center. So we're modeling uh, the impact and um, it's, a, it's more nuanced. Uh, so let me see if I can sort of uh, lay this out. Uh, uh, if you look right at the... Uh, massive uh, lockdown, the mass lockdown phase, sort of uh, right around the middle of March timeframe, 
all the way through to June, we saw a, the suspension or the delay of uh, roughly a quarter of all ongoing clinical trial activity for non-COVID treatments. About a third of all trials pivoted to more of a remote or virtual model and about 45% actually continued following their original protocol in part because the risk to the study volunteer or the patients was too great to transition to uh, more of a decentralized model. And we saw a huge shift in the number of sites that were open for enrollment. 90% of all sites had to close enrollment so that they could make adjustments themselves. Uh, and so we started to see a number of trials delayed. But in the last several months, we've seen a uh, rapid uptick in later stage trials now with a large number of sites open and they project two to three month delay maximum for a lot of these studies. It's the earlier phase trials that have been slower to ease in. And it's also been the studies that were conducted within academic settings that took the longest to uh, pick up again. So we anticipate that there will be delays, Ben, but not nearly as extensive as we thought back in the April, May, June timeframe when we saw such a massive change uh, in delays and suspensions as well. Great, and, and getting back to, to COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics, um, Peter, I, I wanna ask you, you know, what, what do you think is most important regarding the manufacture and distribution of vaccines and therapeutics following an authorization or an approval? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in, in terms of the manufacturing, an incredibly high quality, uh, uh, high standard of quality for uh, the, the manufacturer of these vaccines. And I think the manufacturers have committed to that. I do think that one of the key things here that partners and non-governmental partners, as well as some corporate partners um, on is trying to keep straight who's on first, because it's very likely that we're gonna have multiple two-dose vaccine regimens deployed at the same time. And although eventually we may have mix and match studies done, right now we don't. And so um, making sure people understand, because people move around a lot in this country, and for a vaccine that's given uh, on day one and 21, or day one and 28, or day one and 22, um, uh, it, it um, it ends up being that we're going to need to make sure we keep straight who gets what and that make sure that people come back for those second doses. So I think my, the, I, I worry less about what bio, because I think biopharma is going to make a very high quality product. I think that because we've had some experience with, everyone's worried about the cold chain piece of it. Yeah, I'm a little worried about the cold chain, but I think we've, we can figure that out. My biggest worry is you got to get the vaccine in the arm into the person, then you got to get the person back and you got to make sure that the same, you like the same vaccine, same manufacturer's vaccine to go in that arm twice. Um, I think that could be a little challenging here. So we're trying to work through that. So I, I, I know it sounds very basic logistic -y, but that may be one of the most important things uh, in operationalizing things. Yeah, and, and Michelle, I, I'd love to have you uh, weigh on this, weigh in on this this question as well about what's most important. And, and I'm also, you know, thinking about the infrastructure for getting the vaccine to people in, in rural areas. Uh, I mean, what, what's top of mind for you in terms of a successful manufacturing and distribution model? Well, I think it's really variety. So, you know, I mentioned that there's 191 vac COVID vaccines in development, 10 of which are in late stage clinical trials. Some of those only take one dose. Some of those are stable at room temperature. So we wanna make sure that we have a wide range of possibilities to, to serve the needs of so many different treatment sites. So it's gonna be um, a robust plan that um, CDC has already drawn up with help of external experts from the National Academy of Medicine. And now it's just about getting across that final finish line of finishing up the trials and getting the data and making sure that um, all of the ones that we 
think are going to work are safe and effective and have been tested by FDA and then going out with those distribution plans that really hope to get them to local pharmacies. We're hoping by the spring of 2021. Great. And, and Phil, I, I want to bring you in on this, this, I think, really important question, too, about successful manufacturing and distribution. And, and maybe from the therapeutics perspective, you know, what, what are you thinking about? What's Veer thinking about in terms of making sure people have uh, ready access, you know, at the right time in the right place for, for therapeutics? Thank you, Ben. So maybe I'll just say that you know, as I, as I said once at a talk at Stanford, I said that vaccines are for billions and treatments will be for millions. Um, and uh, the, the challenges of manufacturing a vaccine for billions is enormous, uh, but also the challenge of manufacturing therapeutics for millions is enormous. Uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, Samsung is one of the largest manu uh, CMOs for monoclonal antibody manufacturing. You know, trying to get millions of doses of a monoclonal antibody out the door has never been uh, achieved before. Um, and but I would also want to echo, echo that it's not just a capacity question. I think that the biggest challenge facing, you know, even for example, the recent EUA for Lilly will be the last mile question, which you know whether or not it's as Dr. Mark said, you know, this challenge of you know making sure that the right person gets the right drug. Um, or, or rather the right vaccine and the right arm or in the correct arm, I would say that, you know, this is the same challenge. Like, how do we get physicians and patients to uh, under, to really appreciate that there will be something beneficial out there? How do we get them to actually take it? And then how do we, uh, how do we make it accessible? And I think that that is where really biopharma can do only so much. You know, when it's, when it's aspirin and we've been working on it for 50 years, it's one thing to have an aspirin in every Walgreens. It's a totally different story for a lot of these other uh, medicines and, and vaccines and therapeutics. And I think that that last mile challenge is something that only can be achieved with a really tight partnership with government and non-government agencies. Great. Karen, Karen yeah, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, please. No, just a simple, I mean, to echo what Ben said, I think people is talking a lot about vaccines. They are absolutely important, no doubt about that, but we also need therapeutics. And, and therapeutics have, and in particular, monoclonal antibodies. There are a few in development. There are two who have already submitted emergency use authorization. Lily got that one on Monday. We still need more of those. The doses are pretty high. That is, is significantly costly to manufacture them, and they didn't capture so much help investment. And if you think on, for example, Ayabi, we care a lot about that, low middle income countries, how you make accessible a monoclonal in those geographies. I really think a significant attention is also needed in, this, in the therapeutics space because those are IV drugs. So the administration of an IV monoclonal antibody is not the same as another type of treatment. You need to diagnose the patient very soon so they can benefit the most from the therapeutic window. So there are nuances that I think are extremely important. Great. And Karen, I, I wanted to, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add, I think, you know, summary of what everybody pretty much just said, but the complexity around the distribution and getting it from manufacturer to distributor to the right site to the right provider or pharmacy and then ultimately in the arm um, that's going to require a lot of forecasting planning um, you know collective working together which is we've seen a lot of that happen just to you know almost get to the part here where we think we've got a vaccine ready to go and we're going to have multiple vaccines and so when you put the patient first and it's safety and efficacy which is the most critical important aspect of you know, vaccine and inoculating, you know, public health and, and the population at large. Um, understanding those complexities in the distribution, understanding the cold chain aspects, I think everybody's thinking about all those nuances and making sure that the controls and the processes and every perspective has been thought about to make sure that once distribution gets ready to roll out, that we've covered all of those aspects. Hey, Ben, I just wanted to get yeah. back on uh, Phil's comment. I think that last mile question and Peter obviously touched on this as well that last mile question also really um, requires the use of uh, ad agency support and really creative educating done in a collective way in plain language targeted and customized to specific uh, patient communities 
that's one area where I really haven't seen much uh, movement yet, but we need to band together that kind of creative energy to help us uh, uh, achieve that last mile piece as well. Great. Great. Yeah, that's I, uh, so true that they could, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, please, Anna, no. please, go ahead. Just to highlight <laughs> communication, communication in simple terms. Yeah is missing and we think people understand what an emergency use authorization means or preliminary phase three data people don't know what a phase one phase two three is and and, and we just need to educate and, and translate what does it mean that one day one drug gets emergency use authorization and then is 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 cancer from that day? We need to explain in simple terms yeah, I think, you know, even even when a trial is, is momentarily stopped due to a single adverse event at a single site, you know, the headline reads, you know, trial halted. And, I, you know, I think oftentimes it's sort of confusing to people, you know, that, that don't work in the industry or aren't, you know, experts that, you know, that, that maybe they think the, the vaccine is not, it's not effective or it's dangerous, even though, you know, a trial, you know, a single trial, a single trial site could be halted briefly, you know, could end up that... Uh, the vaccine itself wasn't even responsible for the adverse event. So I, I think that's a good point, Anna. It's a, an important one that the the educational effort, both, you know, from policymakers, from industry, as, as well as, uh, you know, journalists uh, is, is need to really focus on um, communicating uh, effectively to, to the population, given how, how critical it will be once uh, once we get some some authorizations and, and, and approvals. Uh, I, I also wanted to just ask a question about industry reputation, and Michelle, maybe maybe I'll start with you on this one. I think you know the industry is really uh, under a magnifying glass, and, and, and has been. I've I've seen statistics showing that that reputation has has already improved as a result uh, of the response to the pandemic. Uh, reputation of the biopharma industry. Um, I'm talking about here and I just I wonder what you you know might say about the you know the opportunity there for industry reputation and and you know what the industry stands to gain or lose well you know many of the panelists have talked about how complex the scientific development process is and how hard to understand and one of the things that's occurred because of the pandemic is the global public has a front row seat to that process. It has a front row seat to biopharma research and development. And that's helping give some understanding and also kind of lift the veil on what it is, why it takes so long, why it's so complicated, how you have setbacks and how you then have huge breakthroughs and leaps forward. So all of this is tremendously important. But the other thing that's been very, very clear is that our industry has put um, patients first and science first in their response to this pandemic. They've put them first in going ahead and trying to manufacture millions of doses of vaccines before they even know if they'll be approved, doing it completely at risk so that they'll be at the ready should an approval occur. They've been doing it in standing up in support of science and rigorous regulatory control over the process of science. Um, they've been doing it in standing up for equity. We just yesterday sent a letter to Secretary Alex Azar at HHS um, touting the results of our recent summit on the importance of equity in the distribution of therapeutics for COVID. So it's really, really critical that um, the nation and the world see that our companies are very committed to not just creating solutions for patients, but making sure that all patients have access to them as well. Karen, what would you add on, uh, on you know, on industry reputation, and I, don't, I and you may have some thoughts, uh, you know, about what the benefits are of a of a positive or improved um, industry reputation. Sure. Yeah, and I and I agree. Patients first, right? That's always the mission of all of these organizations and the leaders of the organizations. And I think the pandemic has allowed that collective partnering to really drive to the outcome, which is solution um, and cure around the pandemic. But I, I keep saying we're in this triple pandemic, right? You've got the economic stress, you've got COVID, and you've got in inequality, which has really had a spotlight in, within 2020, not only from the pandemic, but from the social justice issues. And I think this industry as a whole has really rallied together, has put their impact, their innovation, and their thought leadership behind it in order to come up with a cure collectively across the health ecosystem. 
And the, the industry will, will benefit from that overall when you have, you know, patients who understand, you know, all of this has been, you know, transparent to them now through um, development of a vaccine, the ability for regulators to become innovative and more efficient in processes in order to see, and the hope is at the end of this, There'll be a lot of stickiness in some of the new innovation aspects that came out of the COVID solution. And you think about the power of what that can then do in oncology or diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So I think the industry has a lot of upside potential. I think they'll maintain this stronghold of, um, you know, con consumerism that they've now um, been kind of spotlighted um, in and around curing the pandemic. And I think it's up to them to really make sure that they keep that forefront um, leadership in, in front of them on, on additional cures as things move forward. Hey, yeah. Dan, if I uh, could just add a question. Yeah. I, I, these are great points about industry reputation. And I just wanted to add that we were in this situation a good you know, 15, 20 years ago where industry uh, and uh, the clinical research enterprise was at a high point in its uh, in the public's view, the public trust of the social good and the uh, the benefit to public health. And we slowly fell out of favor in part because of that lack of transparency. Some of the things that you mentioned, Karen, where this is a kind of a reset moment for us during the pandemic, where we've now come back on top with a highly visible view and. The public is seeing a lot of progress. It's really conveying and, and emphasizing a lot of the strengths and the, the innovative power of our industry. But the transparency piece is so critical. Uh, as we uh, start to really uh, uh, see the results of some of our late stage COVID studies, for example, we have to find ways to translate those results into plain language. We have to make them publicly available. We have to do all we can to really show that this we're doing this in partnership with the public and we have the public's trust built through our transparency and our complete disclosure uh, of what we're learning and uh, how we're applying that to the, the commercialization of uh, new treatments and vaccines. Yeah, and Phil, Phil, did you want to add something on this? Uh, you know, on maybe what the in, what's at stake uh, with with the industry's reputation, or, or if not, and I think we've had some good comments on this topic, but I wanted to give you a chance too. Uh. Yeah, no, maybe I wanted to take a slightly different, um, maybe a slightly different twist on the question, less about industry reputation, but more about you know maybe just reflecting on some of the earlier comments, whether or not we call it last mile. Um, and, you know, I, I think that as an industry, you know, many of us, um, for those of us in the industry, obviously we see ourselves as members of industry, uh, but I think we also, you know, see ourselves as uh, members of society and, and, and therefore what is our societal duty? And I guess I only bring that up because yes, creating a vaccine and a therapeutic is really, really hard, but I think we're all also acknowledging that just the last mile delivery will probably be even harder and mm. educating the public and, and building their trust will be an order of magnitude higher. You know, one of the things that I'm, I'm mindful of is yes, everyone criticizes flu vaccines for not working that well, but let's be honest, we've had flu vaccines for decades now. Many people don't take them or, or distrust the use of those vaccines. We had 35 million people in 2019 get the flu despite the flu vaccine. Now, part of that is because the flu vaccine didn't work for everyone, but a part of that is that people didn't want to take it. And so we, we as a society have a, an urgent need for science education and um, to really elevate the level of discussion so that, you know, we, as, as, as was pointed out, we need simple messages, but we need not oversimplified messages. And I think that that is something that I, I, I really think a lot about because as members of the biotech community, um, it is certainly our foremost, uh, foremost job to put the patient first and to develop drugs. But I think we also have an obligation to recognize that the, the bigger duty ahead of us as members of society is that last mile problem, whether it's education or delivery. And I, and I think that that's something that we need to be mindful of because I think that you know, creating the new drug is, 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 is the cool, quote unquote, cool part, but the, the rest is what's really gonna make an impact on society. 
Yeah, and there's been, you know, several of you have mentioned that, you know, the, the amount of collaboration that's that's happening in the industry and how important that is. And, and transparency has been, an, you know, another um, a word that people have mentioned as being critically important for a number of reasons, not, you know, not just ensuring folks that a vaccine or a therapeutic is safe and, and effective, but being transparent about process items and, you know, when, when things can be expected and, you know, we, how they'll be used, and I'm I'm curious uh, if you know through this collaboration that's happening, is there a sense that the industry will move more toward um, toward outsourcing? You know, different business processes. And Karen, I, I thought you know I'd, l I'd love to get your your take on this. I mean, and, and and one of my questions with this is if there is more outsourcing through this vast collaboration that happens, is is trend you know, is there a risk of transparency being lost through those kinds of handoffs between partners? I think overall within the industry group, within the health ecosystem, but specifically within pharma, outsourcing has always been a big part of um, their process, whether it's, you know, clinical research organizations, CMOs, as well as, um, you know, back office functions. I think the key there is making sure you're really understanding the risks of what you are outsourcing. And I do believe, you know, when we talked at the beginning of this session, when the pandemic hit, understanding where those risks were and those third party risks and, and the downstream impacts became very apparent if companies had proper protocols and processes and, and response rates in place that they were, they were able to, um, uh, certainly uh, control any aspects of risk, whether it's cyber, privacy, as you go into a virtual remote working uh, environment. But uh, what I would say is I'm not sure it's as more outsourcing versus the collaboration of the the side-by-side -side intersects being much more, you know, closing the gaps is maybe what I would say better and working alongside each other to make sure those gaps and those handoffs are, are, are more aligned with the outcome at the end of the day versus when you outsource, people are looking for usually a lower cost provider or more you know, specialized um, you know, ability to manufacture something quicker. Um, I do think it's closing those um, care gaps that help make the process more efficient from innovation to outcome. Excellent, great. I, um, there was a, a question uh, that, that we're gonna move into our, our Q&A here. We're, we're coming up on the end of our time. We've got about eight minutes left, but uh, there was a, a question that came in about, um, and maybe Peter, I'll direct this one to you, which is how will regulatory agencies decide when to resume on-site inspections post-pandemic? Is, is there a specific you know, testing positivity rate in a given geography, or are there other factors that, that you know, regulators will be looking at and making determinations about you know, on-site inspections? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Uh, to, 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 for, for routine inspections, it's going to mainly be looking at the, uh, at the positivity rate in the area that we have to be going to uh, in terms of the safety of the inspectors. Uh, they're there. Um, in some cases, we've been lucky enough that there are local, there are, there are inspectors who are in a given location uh, that can take care of some of these, and we've leveraged that for important inspections. Um, uh, the other piece that does factor into this somewhat um, is the pressing nature of an inspection. Um, uh, for instance, you know, we do have uh, some, some pretty important vaccines and uh, monoclonals coming around, and so we'll we'll take into account that. But you're exactly right that the 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 major thing that will let us get back to doing routine inspections um, will be uh, the epidemiology in the various locations where facilities are. Great. And then uh, I've got a, another question that came in. I think this is a, a follow up uh, to something you said, Peter, and maybe I'll, I'll come back to you and let Ken comment first. But it's a question about what, you know, academic clinical trial organizations could could do better. I mean, is there is there an opportunity, you know, to move out of traditional clinical sites? We you know, we've heard a lot about decentralized trials, virtual trials. And, you know, someone mentioned that they've they've been piloted and I think, you know, I'm curious the, about the extent to which they've actually taken hold, but, but Ken, what, you know, what would you say about academic clinical trials and, and, you know, maybe how they could adapt going forward? 
Yeah, it's it's a kind of a loaded question because there are so many models that are now uh, being used. Um, even within the category of decentralized trials, some are relying, are, are actually being conducted very close to the design of the protocol, but they're using telemedicine. Others have now uh, conscripted a home nursing uh, professional or a home uh, visiting professional, or they're now delivering a study drug directly to the patient's home. And all kinds of sites have adapted to that, whether it's an academic site, it's a for-profit community-based site. I think part of the issue is that it's mostly now very much reactive approaches that are being taken. A lot of the sites, uh, in fact, 60% of sites indicated before the pandemic that they had never had experience with a remote uh, approach, a remote supported approach. So for many sites, this is all very, very new to them. It requires training, it requires systems that can support data that's collected uh, uh, remotely, uh, data that can be integrated with uh, patient health data and observational data. So it's, uh, it's not just for a single group of sites, but for most sites, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot that they need to do to prepare and accommodate these types of approaches if we expect to see them long-term. Right, and Peter, did you wanna add anything to that about you know, how the, the clinical trials enterprise could, you know, could move forward or be more effective? Yeah, I, I actually am gonna be a little controversial here uh, or maybe a little, I, I think it needs to be shaken up some. I, I think that the thing that I this pandemic is something that we, we happened into by accident, which is that I think, I think that for the next pandemic that comes around, we need to have what is the equivalent um, of a pandemic pragmatic clinical trial preparedness plan uh, from doing a tremendous amount uh, on each individual patient to try to draw the most data from each individual patient with interventions and tests to using lots of people distributed in the real world, so to speak, um, and being able to fewer, fewer, fewer data points, perhaps, um, fewer assessments, but the safety in numbers, just being able to have more data from that uh, using potentially remote assessments, et cetera. So I think that we structure this overall so we don't have the proverbial academic quagmire of I want it this way, you want it this way, and then we end up with the lowest common denominator of not really studying the most important questions. Good authority because I was one of those people once too for about 15 <laughs> years of my career. So I, I know what it's like. But I think in this pandemic, that I, I think if, if I had to say who led and who lagged a bit, I'd say industry led and um, uh, academics, it's not a knock. It's just they weren't prepared the same way. And we need to be more prepared to move into a different mode um, next time something like this comes around, which I hope is the 12th of never. But um, I, I think we have to be prepared. Is there a way to incentivize that shift? Peter, do you have any thoughts about what, what incentives yeah, might I, need well, to change? Yeah. yeah, I think it's actually how you reimburse for trial. I think, I think we have to figure out how you would deal with trial reimbursement, how you would, um, and, and, and academic centers, it would, it would be how it was credit types of trials, um, who runs them. Those are a lot of issues which I think would have to be dealt with, but I think the, the, the main incentive would be to essentially figure out a way to make sure that uh, you could compensate the local trial while to participate. All right. Well, I, uh, I think we're going to have to bring it to a close here, unfortunately. I, I, I want to thank uh, all of the panelists for uh, a really excellent discussion.